Now the other thing that we need to know about the microglia is that if we don't take care of them, they will not take care of us. So as we get older, it turns out that the microglia move into a more inflammatory state as their resting state which is why we've been seeing issues with people as they get older. It's much easier for me and I hope to see total recovery on my kids that I'm working on, my teenagers, my 20-somethings. When you're looking at my 60-year-olds who have been in this shape for this long, it's harder. And this is why it's harder. It's harder because the microglia gets stuck in this inflammatory state. But it's not just about those who are suffering with pain and depression. When we do MRIs of people who have other symptoms and other things going on, not necessarily related to this, what we see is normal degenerative changes associated with aging. Normal degenerative changes associated with aging are not normal. Normal degenerative changes associated with aging is the symptom, is the findings rather, of a chronically inflamed brain. So these are people, most of us, who have had ongoing inflammation in our brains for years and years and years that has not been attended to. You want a better brain, we need to turn off the inflammation. There's a time and a place for it, but we don't want it going on chronically. So this is what we see going on. And when we're talking about <coughs> inflammation in the brain, I'm focused on depression and chronic pain and chronic fatigue, okay? But the reality is, I think it's a spectrum disorder. And the other end of that spectrum is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis. This is a serious problem. Now your genetics are gonna end up where, where you end up on that spectrum, but the fact of the matter is neuroinflammatory disease kills. And it's something that we all need to be attending to, especially as our population ages. So there's a strong correlation between brain aging, neurodegenerative, and the redox imbalance as well as chronic low-grade inflammation. The redox imbalance is important, and we're going to talk about that now, because this begins to give us some insight as to how utilizing supplements we may be able to slow and hopefully reverse some of these processes. So neurodegenerative changes are characterized by chronic microglial overactivation and oxidative stress. It's now beginning to be recognized that reactive oxygen species produced by either microglia or the surrounding environment not only impact neurons but also modulate microglial activity. Despite its high dependence on oxidative metabolism, the brain has low levels of antioxidants and is vulnerable to oxidative stress. This is our input point. We know that the brain does not have lots of natural antioxidants. So we know that as long as there's ongoing damage in the brain, there's lots of oxidation going on, and what we need is antioxidants to help address that. But the question is, which ones and how much? When we talk about oxidative stress, this is what happens when you have more reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, available than you have antioxidants. So there's an imbalance. And these reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species are a result of cellular metabolism, typically in response to some damage. All right, they pre predominantly originate from activation of inflammatory and immune cells in the microglia and the mitochondria. So the supplements that we've got some good evidence on are these, and we're gonna go through each of these and talk about the dosing of them so that you'll have an understanding of what you can do. There is no miracle supplement here. It looks like some combination of these things is probably what's going to be best, and it looks like <coughs> the, ter the dosing, we're reasonably clear on on many of these things. This guy is particularly exciting because they just finished a study on Alzheimer's in which they found that administration of resveratrol reduced the formation of beta amyloid plaque. That's very cool. So beta amyloid plaque is one of the major pathogenic findings in Alzheimer's disease, and so this is the beginning of an insight as potentially how we can reverse it. Now, will reversing it reverse the Alzheimer's? We haven't made that step yet. But we do know that we can begin to at least influence one of the pathogenic findings in Alzheimer's. So glutathione. Glutathione is the main actor here. It is the main anti-inflammatory in the central nervous system, antioxidant in the central nervous system. 
It's a crucial role in maintaining the redox balance, particularly in astrocytes and microglia. Glutathione is essential for mitochondrial survival, and its levels decrease with age. Okay? So we see decreasing antioxidants, we see increasing inflammatory state of the microglia, and we see increasing neurodegeneration with age. So if we can do something to increase our levels of glutathione, maybe we can slow the process down. So it's crucial, has a lot of different roles here. The business of the most abundant endogenous antioxidant, xenobioxidant drugs, drugs given to us from, from other places. All right, optimal functioning for the immune system. There's a lot of stuff glutathione does. Glutathione depletion has marked consequences for the balance of the immune system, all right? Oxidative nitro nitrosative stress pathways, regulation of energy production and mitochondrial survival. We need it to keep ourselves in balance, to keep ourselves in balance in terms of inflammation and anti-inflammation, in terms of destruction and repair. It's a normal cycle in the body, but at one point it tips over and it moves more in destruction and less in repair. We want to push that back. What we're talking about here in terms of the aging process is not doing this, which is a slow glide down, but what we'd like to actually accomplish is optimal health and then we're done. <laughs> right? Who wants to decline and see increasing disability? Quick show of hands, anyone? Exactly. Now, we'd like that optimal health to be for a really long time. And the good news is, biologically, it looks like 120 is a reasonable number for human beings. The good news also, if you've been reading the post lately, they, were, they featured two women, both over 100, one was 102, the other one 101, who are quite active in their communities and continuing to work. One is an artist, I don't know what the other one was doing. But they're vibrant, leading very full lives. They're healthy. We're going to see more and more and more of this. And so it is beholden upon us to start taking care of ourselves now <laughs> so that we can have that vibrant, healthy life well into our hundreds. Because that's the expectation now. We are going to be able to do that. But we want to do it with vitality. All right, so depletion dysfunction plays an important role during the onset and the progression of neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases. So losing glutathione has consequences. We see depression, we see Parkinson's disease, we've demonstrated glutathione deficiencies in myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, and in fibromyalgia. Generally poorly absorbed and generally poorly bioavailable, its effects of oral glutathione supplementation and oxidative uh, stress biomarkers in human volunteers in one study in 2010 showed no effect. So just giving glutathione wasn't good enough in this study. We've gotten a little clever since then. Since then, they've modified the forms in which glutathione is given, and a couple of studies now have shown, in fact, that administration of glutathione and these other forms are quite effective at improving the functioning of the immune system uh, and reducing inflammation in the central nervous system. So we can give glutathione. Uh, liposomal glutathione in particular, which we like to do, uh, the Th1 is, part of, is the immune system. Uh, response to mycobacterium tuberculosis, meaning that these individuals, when given glutathione, all right, had a better outcome. They survived better. All right? These are peripheral diseases, but nevertheless, we're seeing glutathione being useful for treatment adjunctively for other, other disease conditions. Uh, they looked at N-acetylcysteine and glutathione. We'll get to N-acetylcysteine in a minute. Uh, as a novel sublingual form, found that it was particularly effective also. Uh, for addressing oxidative stress and for reducing inflammation. All right, and it compared better specifically to N-acetylcysteine uh, using the sublingual glutathione. The point of this is simply there is evidence that suggests that giving glutathione orally in certain forms can be effective in improving immune functioning. And ultimately immune functioning is what we want improved because that's what's going to reduce inflammation in the central nervous system. We also can give intravenous uh, glutathione, so we give it IV. We have seen cases, and there are case reports in the literature, of people with Parkinson's disease given glutathione IV and their, their tremors stop. It doesn't last, but you can see cessation of the tremors for as long as 45 minutes to an hour after giving intravenous glutathione. So that tells us, one, it's getting into the central nervous system. 
And two, if we can somehow figure out how to keep the levels up on an ongoing basis, we can actually potentially reverse the symptoms of Parkinson's. So how do we give it? How much do we give? Oral glutathione, somewhere between 250 to 500 milligrams twice a day. Liposomal, we give it 450 milligrams a day. Sublingual, it's 450 milligrams a day. And IV, we're in the studies now. So what I'm, there are people using different dosages, but these are quoted from the studies that, that we've reviewed. And that's at 1,400 milligrams once to twice a day. All right, so these are the dosages that in studies have shown to be effective in reducing inflammation and reducing oxidative stress. And specifically, with, uh, I focused here on central nervous system effects, not just per not peripheral. And acetylcysteine is an antioxidant. It's a precursor of L-cysteine and reduces and reduced glutathione. Uh, gives sulfhydryl groups in cells. It's a scavenger of free radicals, so it does lots of good antioxidant things. Glutathione itself is made up of glutamate, glycine, and cysteine. All right, so maybe if we can't get glutamate, or I'm sorry, uh, glutathione into the system effectively, maybe what we can do is give the precursors that will get across the blood-brain barrier well and build up glutathione levels. In this case, cysteine has the lowest intercellular concentration, and therefore it's the rate-limiting molecule in glutathione production, meaning that lacking cysteine, you can't build glutathione. You can't, you, you need these three blocks to build this. If you're missing any block, you can't build it. That's the rate limiting one right there. So if I can give supplementation of that, I can increase the amount of glutathione in the system. Cool. All right. As I said, it was questionable in some studies whether or not glutathione crosses the blood-brain barrier. I think we have actually addressed that, that it does. Uh, NIC does contribute cysteine to the CNS across the blood-brain barrier. Ah, so now I can get cysteine into the system and let the body build its own glutathione. All right, we've seen its clinical applications for major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, addiction, and neurodegenerative disorders. All right, remember neurodegenerative is a great big scary term. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. All right, these are very serious diseases we're talking about. And we've seen some improvement in people given NAC. How much? 200 to 400 milligrams a day. Anecdotally, that is outside of the literature in just case reports, anywhere from 500 to 600 grams a day. However, at very high dosages, you can get toxic, kidney toxicity, liver toxicity from N-acetylcysteine, so you do have to pay attention to these things. Melatonin. Melatonin is a great antioxidant. It's a hormone produced by the penile gland, macrophages, astrocytes, and microglia. <clears throat> it's uh, responsible for our circadian rhythm. It is an antioxidant. Uh, it helps with the functioning of the immune system. All right, so people having trouble with regulating their sleep cycles, we use melatonin to help them do that. People who are having problems with psychiatric disease, melatonin turns out to be a nice supplement for them. With other sleep disorders, with migraines, with fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain, and neurodegenerative changes. Again, I'm what I'm showing you here is a list of things that the studies have shown them to be effective. These are not slam dunk finished, but rather the beginnings of a literature base to substantiate the use of these things and tell us what the safety is. All right, this talks about how melatonin may be effective. Um, so it effectively pro pro protects neuronal cells from uh, A beta mediated toxicity via antioxidants and anti-amyloid properties. Melatonin not only inhibits uh, amyloid beta generation, but arrests the formation of amyloid fibrils uh, by a structure-dependent interaction with amyloid. Amyloid, again, is this business of the pathogenic finding in Alzheimer's. So it looks like it's reducing uh, the, the things that are, we're finding in Alzheimer's in abundance that are linked to the Alzheimer's. We're not entirely sure what the amyloid is doing, except it doesn't belong there. So anything we can do to prevent the creation of that amyloid is probably a good idea. How much? Anywhere from 0.1 milligrams, because we'll use that for moving the circadian cycle, to as high as 100 milligrams. We generally stick to dosages somewhere between 5 to 10 milligrams, 3 to 10 milligrams. 
Ubiquinone. Ubiquinone, <coughs> when I was doing this research, I learned a simple thing. Quinones, which is what CoQ10 is, okay, and UBQH, but the reason it's called ubiquinol is because it's ubiquitous throughout the body. There's lots of it everywhere. All right, so <coughs> it's located in the inner mitochondrial membranes. The mitochondria are the energy sources of the cell. All right, they transfer, there's a lot of things they do without getting into the specifics of the, of the chemistry of it, but they're in antioxidants. And you need them for ATP. ATP is also one of the fuels of the body. Uh, essential for normal mitochondrial functioning. They're anti-inflammatory, they're neuroprotective. And they also regulate gene expression. So you want something that will allow genes to express at the right rate, not too fast, not too slow, so that they, the body's capable of responding to changes in the environment. They reduced glutathione in patients with muscle pain, but all forms of deficiencies showed improvement after oral supplementation. All right, particularly, we'll get that on the next slide, but we've seen deficiencies observed in people suffering with typical symptoms in fibromyalgia. Now keep in mind fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a generalized muscle pain, right? Except that there's nothing wrong with the muscles. The problem is it's essentially mediated pain syndrome. And so the effects of, of the CoQ10 have to be in the central nervous system, not peripherally. Uh, the other thing that we see, is it DNA? You see CoQ10 deficiencies can be created by statins. Anybody taking a statin medication? So statins are used to lower cholesterol. When statins were originally developed, they were originally going to market them in combination with CoQ10 because they knew that the statins depleted them. I'm not sure what the thinking was that eventually they pulled it out, but the fact of the matter is anybody on a statin should be supplemented with CoQ10. All right, <clears throat> we know that deficiencies result in cancer issues. The deficiencies can be created uh, by statins, beta blockers, and tricyclic antidepressants. So medications that we just give people, we don't think about downstream problems that we're creating. So if we're not aware that we're going to create deficiencies in CoQ10, and the importance of CoQ10, the end result of which is we give these drugs and we don't know what damage we've done. So tricyclic antidepressants, um, nortriptyline, amitriptyline, Elevil, okay? Beta blockers, which are used constantly for treatment of all kinds of cardiac problems and hypertension. All right, there's a long list of those. We should be supplementing with CoQ10 when we're giving people these things automatically because we know the medication we're giving is going to deplete them. We know that the depletion is going to result in worsening of oxidative stress in the system and centrally more neurodegeneration. Conditions in which CoQ10 has been effective, looking at neurodegenerative disease, neuromuscular disease, muscular dystrophy, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, again, migraines and depression. The dosage is 300 milligrams per day divided in three dosage. For fibromyalgia patients, 300 to 2,400 milligrams a day in people with Parkinson's disease. 